anticipate the upcoming publication of the new Methuen Drama Student Edition of DNA, which is publishing in June, and it will be edited by Claire. Um, and obviously, DNA is brilliantly written by Dennis. So I'm going to hand over to Claire now to ask all the wonderful questions to Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much to Bloomsbury for hosting this and to Dennis um, for coming. I'm just going to give a, let's say a couple of words by way of an introduction to Dennis for people who might not know the author. So Dennis started writing plays in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, and one of his first plays, Debris, was staged in the Theatre 503, which is a little room above a pub. And from that room above a pub, he's gone on to occupy some of the biggest uh, theatres in the UK and across the world. So just to name a few, um, DNA was staged at the National Theatre. It was commissioned as a play for young people by National Theatre Connections. Um, he's also worked for National Theatre Scotland with Our Teachers a Troll, which is another wonderful play written for children. Um, he's been staged at the Royal Court in London with um, George Mastromas in 2013 and Girls and Boys, which starred Kerry Mulligan in 2018. And he's also worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company with his um, adaptation of King Lear called The God's Weep in 2010 that starred Jeremy Irons. And also his smash hit that you I'm sure you've all heard of Matilda the musical which is adapted from Roald Dahl's um, novel for children and which has given many children and adults including me and my children one of the best afternoons of their lives I think um, so he's also a writer for screen um, we can see him in some undisclosed BBC location right now and he's written um, a sitcom pulling with Sharon Horgan in the early 2000s and then the dystopian um, series for Channel 4, Utopia. And then finally, last year, The Third Day came out on Sky um, HBO with Jude Law, Naomi Harris, Paddy Considine, Emma Watson. Um, so he's a really prolific writer. And I think like the great writers um, across the centuries, he treats universal themes, whether they're violence, as we see in, in uh, uh, DNA, or death, or power, inequality, loyalty, and love, these huge themes. But what he does is he grafts them onto the everyday lives of very recognisable people, like we see in DNA, um, kids that could be in, in, um, in any school that we might have gone to school with. So I'm not really going to rehearse the plot of DNA. I assume that you know it from the questions that you've asked. Um, uh, you have submitted over 60 questions. So uh, that's just about one a minute, Dennis. Um, yeah. No, I've, <laughs> I've condensed them. I'm sorry if I won't cover all of your questions, but I've tried to group them um, into about 10 questions that we hopefully will have time for. Um, and handily, if your questions aren't answered, I think a lot of them will be answered, I hope, with the new student edition that looks um, not only at contexts and themes and characters in the play, but it also looks at... Um, it's got lots of teaching tips. I'm a teacher myself, so it's got lots of tips on how to teach the play as a piece of literature and also rehearsal ideas if you're teaching it as a performance. So, OK, um, Dennis, these you, thank you to the teachers. You really made my job very easy. I didn't have to think up any questions at all because you've done all the work. Um, so, first question, why did you write DNA? Were you inspired by something in particular or was it because it was a National Theatre Connections uh, Commission? Um, it was um, it was a National Theatre Com Connections Commission, but I, I was given two bits of advice uh, in writing it. One I thought was great and one I thought was terrible, so I ignored it. One was um, just write your next play you know, don't um, don't make any, you know, write whatever it is you feel you want to write. And I think that's always really good advice because then that way you get the, what people really care about. And the other one I think was um, remember to write from the point of view of 
the people who are do, doing it. And I thought that's terrible advice because you can never write from anyone else's point of view. You can only really, I mean, what you can do is you can hope that you are the kind of person that understands um, m m people. You know, that's what you hope for, but you can't actually really sort of, you can't, I don't think it's right to second guess other people and try and to figure out what they want. You've got, you know, you, you've got, you've got to write some something and then people look at it and go, well, I don't like that, it's, you know. So it was that, but I mean, I think, uh, you know, whenever you write something, whether you're commissioned or not, normally what it is, is it's, it, it's a few things, there are things that are kind of bubbling around in your brain and they sort of suddenly coalesce into uh, a play. There wasn't a particular incident that was, beh that was behind it, but, um, you know, there's sort of events in my own life that are connected to it. Um, and can you talk about, though, I, I mean, unless unless it's too personal can you be a bit more specific what were those events yeah. i mean are they events from from around 2007 2008 or are they events from when you were well, the same age as the people in the play the kids more, in the play more 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 the, more the second one uh, i mean the events around 2008 i mean you know that's sort of just after the iraq war and you know we were still in the middle of all that craziness you know and i think i was very obsessed by that for quite a while and my early plays are sort of about that you know, and about that period and the war on terror and stuff like that. And I think what w I was writing about consciously was um, whether it's right to do things, whether it's right for the group to sacrifice the individual for the group. So that's what happens is the individual gets sacrificed for the group. And that seemed to be, I think a lot of our civil, it seemed to me a lot of our civil liberties at the time, were, there was talk about sacrificing those civil, civil liberties um, because it would be, make us safer. You know, that was the idea, uh, quite apart from the fact that I don't think it will make us safer. And I think that, that, that has been borne out. But I think I, what was sort of buzzing around in my head at the time is, is that is that sort of right? Is it right to sort of uh, make that sacrifice, even if we know it is going to make us safer? Is it still right to treat an individual like shit to do that? You know, um, and uh, the play is sort of about that. They, you know, the, the group. Um, they decide to do something that will be better for the group. I think um, uh, Phil says, you know, what's, you know, what's this, this is for us. This is for all of us. It's, is it one person or all of us, you know, and, and um, that's really what it's about. I mean, the personal sort of stuff is like, I just remember as a kid um, when I was probably about, Like suddenly things changed and it felt like you it felt suddenly really really dangerous and and there was like a we bec we changed from a group of children to a pack of children you know and like it, it, if you were at the heart of that pack we were safe but th there were like concentric rings um going out from the beating heart of that pack and the further on the outs uh, uh, through those rings you were the da more dangerous life became and to be on the uh, on the outside entirely was terrifying so we it became brutal and you sort of and I, I remember sort of having a fight with this guy who was you know a lovely lovely guy who always treated me really well I mean you know had been really nice to our family not to our, our family but I mean, his family had been really nice to me you know I, I, we were a bit sort of uh, you know, I don't want to go into it too much, but I mean, just to, I don't want to bore you, but he was, he was a really lovely kid. And uh, I remember having a fight with him because I still feel shame about it now because it was, I was trying to impress other people, you know. So it was really about that sort of being a kid and the idea that um, it's just you and other kids and no grown ups are going to help. So following on from that, we've got a really interesting question about how. Um, if you'd written the play today, would it would you have written it the same or would you write it differently? And specifically in terms of bullying, one of the questions uh, referenced social media and online bullying. And I yeah. and so so what would be different if you wrote the play today, do you think? I think a lot would be different. I mean, I don't think I would take the play online because I just think that's not dramatically that interesting. Um, I think, um, I, I actually don't think it's a play about bullying. I know everyone else does, but I think um, I'm not sure there is bullying in the play, but the biggest act of bullying happens before the play starts. So the play itself, you know, they're, they're sort of, the play itself is uh, um, after this sort of, um, it, you know, it was in the wake of that, really, you know, and the play itself is, is about how these kids are, are negotiating each other. And, and, and you know, I've, I, I don't really, to be honest with you, I haven't written any differently for them than I've written for 
grown-ups you know and it's not too different from the thing that i'm doing at the moment you know where grown-ups are sort of treating each other pretty badly you know um so i think if i wrote it today I, you'd, you'd, there'd definitely be changes but i'm not sure um i would particularly sort of br bring it online or something because it, it wasn't an attempt to represent the youth of 2008 and you know particularly and it wouldn't you know i, I wouldn't try and represent the youth of 2021 because i am not a youth in 2021 though i look it <laughs> oh sorry sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that's interesting what you say about how the bullying actually happens before the play even starts because it seems to me that once the play started actually the characters are all trying to do what they think's right even though they get it increasingly wrong I think that's right. I think they are trying to do what they think is right. And I think the, the, the difficulty with um, we, we tend to think of bullying as this really binary thing. And in some ways it is. Look, I'm not, you know, I'm not making any excuses for, for fucking bullying at all, you know. But in some ways it, it's, it is, in some ways it is binary. In some ways it just isn't. In some ways, you know, I, there, were, there were times at school where, you know, I was bullied, you know, quite harshly in my early secondary school. And it really, really affected me for many years. Uh, but there are other times where I was bullying people and, you know, there's a, there's an argument to say that many of our interactions with um, people at school are bullying, and there's many of our interactions as grown-ups as are sort of there are elements of bullying. You know, and I, I think it's it, you know we can be too we can sort of be too. I mean, you know, I, you know, I think we you, I think it's right that we call out bullying wherever we find it, and we sort of try to live a life where we don't have it. But we can also be too binary about it and not look at it in any nuanced way. Yeah, and I think you show that really well with the characters because each in their own way, in a way, they are both bullies and victims. Uh, they seem to fluctuate between them and the people who start off being bullies, whether it's um, uh, John Tate or Phil, end up mentally distressed and isolated and alone and fallen in a way, don't they? That's right. Yeah. And I mean, for me, a, a big thing for me in all of my work is, has not has been sort of um, I like moral complications. So even in TV work that I've done, like Utopia, I sort of it's kind of hard to sort of say who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And I mean, the, the, it's not you know who the good guys are. But at the same time, I think if you can't understand the bad guys, then there wasn't really any point to writing it because part of our part of part of creating these things should be illuminating how other people think and if we if we just if we just kind of go if we can if we can separate ourselves from really bad behavior that that people indulge in we'll never ever understand it and we'll never be able to sort of do anything about it if we can't find it in ourselves so you talked about how when you first wrote the play what was looming large was the war on terror and these images come to mind for me of things like Abu Ghraib and and Guantanamo which were which were mm. you know it was written only a few years after those were circulating but what about those kinds of <laughs> geopolitical resonances now one of the questions said are there kind of um, echoes C can we relate it to the big um issues of our day right now whether they're black lives matter or covid19 or women's rights attacks on women um you know and and, and uh, women's position in public space so um i think that's quite a difficult answer a question but what what yeah. kind of resonances do you think the play might have today i mean i think you know what what um uh it, this might be a slightly long-winded answer and i appreciate we haven't got a lot of time but you know, one of my favourite um, plays is Wojciech by Buchner, and it's it's actually an intensely political play. He was a really, really political writer. Um, I think he was imprisoned for his political views, um, uh, but he uh, was writing about a real character. There was a real Wojciech um, who was um, subject to all of these awful experiments, and Buchner was writing very specifically about a, th a political thing in his time. None of that remains. All that remains is this incredible play. And I think if you're writing, if you if you're lucky and you 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 know what you're, you're aiming for as a writer is to is to write about something that is larger than just the is larger than the thing at the moment. Um, and if you manage to hit that, then it can then be applied at other times. So I mean, I, I 
don't know is the answer i mean if you can if you can apply apply it to those things then i've probably done quite well <laughs> if you can't then you know it is you know i, I mean it's uh you, you not every plane has to sort of hit those dizzying heights you know but um you know i think it's always worth you you tr- there's there's something at the heart of human behaviors that is slightly that is different from what those behaviors are causing at the moment and if you can get at that then it can be moved then it can work in other times yeah and i think this idea that you mentioned before about sacrificing the one on behalf of the group and mm. the group mentality i mean there are resonances now i think of of populism of right-wing populism mm. for, yeah. for, for me and uh you know kind of um and and, and marginalization um because there are certain characters obviously adam but certain others which are who are pretty m- mercilessly sacrificed in a way for the kind of for mob rule in, in yeah. the, the and time characters so. sacrifice themselves like when we when we mm. when we sort of um it's group think is a really really easy thing to indulge in and it's a really really sort of um difficult thing to resist you know we we all we you know we all think that we're such individuals and we we kind of and we're just not none of us are really you know we're all really you know uh, um you know someone from the 13th century if someone from you know that you know 13th century britain came and looked at any of us they would be just how shocked at how similar we all are the things that they would look at us and they wouldn't understand and and the things that were confusing were were the things that we were all doing you know and so we are actually kind of uh, you know hugely similar and we we do kind of think together and it's sort of and i think that that there's really good reasons for that you know we have to sort of interact within society and work together but it can it you know i think they choose themselves to to be part of this, you know, and that's what happens with all, all, um, you know, movements, you know, people choose to be part of it. And if that movement starts going in a difficult direction, then you often people go with it. So, yes, sorry. Sorry. I'm just going to interrupt one second because I think we might have lost Dennis on screen. I can hear him. Hello. (laughs) <laughs> but I just wonder, it might be your Wi-Fi, Dennis, which is absolutely fine, because I can hear you fine, but I just wonder whether you turn your camera on and off, it might just pop you back on again. There we go. How about that? Am I there? See, no, it's just still black. Oh, I'll turn myself off for a second, yeah, and then I'll turn myself on. That sounds wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, there I am. Can you see me? No. It says here, video stop working. Try unplugging and plugging in your webcam. Or switch to another device i think we probably can't do that yeah no don't do that we can i mean i can we can hear you perfectly it's fine yeah. so yeah i we'll think just, we i think um we'll carry on much though it's a huge loss <laughs> <laughs> not to see you uh i think the uh yeah we can hear you absolutely loud and clear yeah um, it's fine. so leading on from the comments you have said i wonder if you can answer this question can you sum up what the main message of the play is and what is the main message for young people uh i find that a really difficult question to uh, to answer i never really i've never really think in terms of messages when i write because what I normally write, what I normally find is that I'm, I'm sort of asking a question and I'm not even answering a question um, because the only way I can sort of write is to sort of, you know, it's um, it's normally something that I don't have an answer for that is interesting to write. You know, if, if I know the answer, it's kind of a boring, it's a boring process and it's a boring result, I think, because then I'm just preaching at you and saying, you know, this is this is how you should be. And I, I, I hate that kind of stuff because I think I don't have a right to tell anyone how they should be. I certainly don't, don't matter how old they are. My, my daughter's 20 months and I don't think I'm morally superior to her in any way whatsoever. You know, she, she, I, I mean, I can I can tell her not to stick her finger in plug sockets and stuff like that. But, you know, morally, that's a whole different question, you know. So I, I find that a really difficult question to answer. But um, I think if, I, if you ask, if you put a gun to my head and ask me what the play's about, I suppose it is about... Um, you know, it's about uh, whether the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the individual. Mm. That said, 
that is not necessarily what the exam board and i should probably sort of you know re, you know put this in in capitals um you know the, the don't listen to me um you know if you, you've got a lot of kids that want to pass that exam so that might not be what the exam board the exam board may disagree with me about what my play is and i'm not the exam board so they may be wrong but you know it's still yeah it's and still actually difficult. as a teacher and as someone who marks as many of the teachers all the teachers here mark hundreds of scripts it's quite nice to read something that you really hadn't thought of and so mm. I suppose it's up to it's up to teenagers it's up to students themselves to decide what they think the how the play resonates and what they think it might mean um so um speaking of the fact that it was written for young audiences and young actors did what so what might be the the red line that you wouldn't cross in terms of what you might include because it does include violence um at one stage kathy puts a plastic bag over someone's head and we see that on stage that's some violence we actually see on stage of, of um of uh, is it i can't remember is it danny who is nearly suffocated um so what what is your approach towards quite i suppose adult themes um in a children's play in a play for young people uh well i was once i once sh shared a, a platform with uh, brian lavery who's a writer i really admire and have done for years and she she'd written i, th I can't remember it was treasure island i think it was for the national and someone asked her this and her answer was better than mine uh, ever has been and, and they said what exactly this question what allowances do you make and she just said less swearing and I thought that was a really good answer. You know, it's it's um, you don't really. I I didn't find myself making any allowances. The play where it went where it wanted to. Um, the red lines. I think. I mean, I think it's possibly true that um, you don't go in certain areas, but you. I don't think you censor yourself. So, for example, even with Matilda, it's quite a. Dark, it's probably for younger ages than this, and it's. But it still goes into some dark places and our teacher is a troll it's probably even younger than this so it never needed to you but you just instinctively don't go into you know you you, st you instinctively if you're if you're writing a play for six-year-olds you instinctively don't start talking about decapitation or or, or you know or you know the, the fact that lives may end because that, that would be silly but i mean I, I think i don't know i mean i i, I think it i wanted to treat the kids that were going to perform it it's to me when i wrote this play it didn't actually matter whether the play was good or not um and that's an unusual place to write from normally you want a play to be good um what mattered to me i mean i wanted the play to be good but what mattered to me more was that the people who were doing it were enjoyed it and got something out of it and i remember when i was at like doing youth theater the things that i really responded to was pinto and, you know, I, I didn't understand it and I'd never seen anything like it before in my life, you know, but I thought this is really, really amazing stuff. And it, it made me think there's something out there that I want to investigate, you know, I want to have a look at. And it really sort of started me looking more and more into theatre and, you know, um, set me on my career path, I suppose, you know. But um, but more importantly than that, it, may, it meant that later on in life I went and got a degree, you know, because I'd left school young and all this sort of thing. And so I suppose I was tr sort of thinking if this can... If people, if these young people enjoy playing these parts, then they may then go on and look at other bits of theatre. I saw sort of as a gateway drug for theatre. <laughs> um, I've got a question now, um, which links a bit to what you're to what you've just said, in that you mentioned that you'd left school quite young, and I'm just there's. Um, there are two things. One of them is people have been asking about the characters. What's your favourite character? Um, uh, what's the relationship between Leah and Phil? But I'm also thinking in terms of the characters about class. And this is something I'm not sure is very often discussed mm -hmm. with your work. But you yourself come from a working class background and work working class in that you left school very early and worked on a market. and what is the relevance of 
class when it comes to this play and to the characters and to your theatre in general? Um, I don't know. I mean, I early on in my career, I, I deliberately, I mean, I remember writing, the first couple of plays I wrote were set on a council estate and that was like, I've been brought up in a council house, you know, and like that was, that was a natural thing for me to do. Um, and then I remember, but at the time there was loads of council estate stuff going on and I hated all of it because it was social realism and it, it, I just didn't like it. It was also written mostly by people who weren't really working class, if I'm honest. And I just didn't like any of it. It, it felt really grim and dreary and not exciting. And um, I remember an artistic director saying to me, I've written a play that was set on the surface of Mars, you know, uh, part of it was on the surface of Mars, part of it was on a council estate, and part of it was in an interview room in NASA. It never got performed, but it was a mad play. And uh, I remember this guy saying to me, you know what, you should stick to council estate. And I was <laughs> furious with him. I was like, and it made me never want to write anything about it. So I think I sort of rejected a bit of that early on. I think as I've grown older, I'm, I mean, it's been important for me to sort of write, um, I think now, it's really difficult for working class people in, in this industry. It's, you know, the, the, the ladders have been pulled up and, um, you know, the representation of working class people in things like TV and film where I'm working at the moment is appalling. You know, the opportunities for working class people, you know, social mobility for working class people isn't very good, you know. So I think I've, as I've got older, I've become more connected to it. Uh, I, I think when I wrote this, I wrote voices and they, I, they some of them probably sounded working class because that's, what would be in my head but I also was quite careful that this play could be performed by a multitude of people and I said you can swap genders and stuff like this and actually I've seen this play performed in all boys schools and all girls schools I've seen it performed in um, you know really really kind of rough inner city academies that feel a little bit like prisons to be honest with um, you know uh, you know um, uh, where where you know, uh, um, amazing kids uh, don't have opportunities. And I've seen it performed in really posh private schools. And I think, oddly, it's sort of worked in a lot of those places. So I think um, I, I deliberately didn't really write accents in there. I wrote only the things that I was interested in. So it's not that I'm saying there are no differences between people. So men, men and women, for example, I don't, I'm not saying there are no differences, but I think there are lots and lots of similarities between men and women. So, um, you know, I think a man feels, a, a jealousy is, something that we both a man or a woman the, the the feeling of it the intensity of it is is a, is a real thing you depending on who you are your life experience and a whole bunch of other things you may act out on it differently but the actual feeling i think probably is something we similar so i think i concentrated on those rather than sort of specifying things so um so drilling down a bit who is your favorite character and another question is who do you feel sorry for most <sighs> Oh, I feel sorry for a lot of them, actually. I, I, I think Leah and Phil are my favourite characters. Um, I feel bad saying favourite characters because you sort of, you know, you worry about all the others. Um, I think Leah and Phil, I think Phil is the most misunderstood character in the play. Often he's seen as this Machiavellian uh, manipulator, and I never think he's like that. I think he's just this quiet lad who gets caught in this thing that he doesn't really want to get caught in. He sort of tries not to be involved in it. And but then once he is involved in it, everyone's looking to him and, you know, and I think Leah is, she just projects all this stuff on Phil. We've got no idea what Phil is, really. He's just quiet. I think Phil has probably got his head down and is thinking, if I just keep my mouth shut, then, you know, I've got another, if he's, say he's 12 or 13, whatever age he is, he's got another four or five years of this and then he can be an adult get the hell out he knows how dangerous all this stuff is but he ends up getting brought into it so I feel sorry for Phil I feel sorry for John Tate and I feel I feel sorry for all of them actually I think none of them Kathy I think is the only one that ends up finding herself in a positive not a positive way but in a way that she likes you know not exactly uh, positive she cuts off I know. A, a first year's finger doesn't she no, no that, I don't sorry I mean not I don't mean a, a rumor she finds herself like she's. Sort of, I think Kathy is possibly a sociopath, and she finds her life path um, through these events. Everyone else um, is ends up very, very unhappy. Mm, mm, yeah. Um, so um, you you um, you mentioned that you've seen this 
play in all sorts of different settings in all boys schools or girls schools also there have been some major productions the first production was by paul miller at the national theater and then anthony banks did a big tour of the whole of the uk there have been productions in france um many different translations um so a couple of questions. One of them is, what have you what have you particularly liked about any particular production you saw? Mm -hmm. And more specifically, people have been asking if you liked it in the round. I know the National Youth Theatre did it in the round um, or end on. Um, do you prefer it in a more realist style or a more stylized expressionist style? So, um, yeah, what has particularly appealed to you about what's worked really well in staging? Um, it's it's an odd thing. Like I, I I I sort of actively go out of my way not to see it or know anything about it. Not not particularly this play, but anything I've done. Like once you you it's so intense. The process of writing is very intense, and you rewrite, you rewrite. Once it's on and moving. I feel like you have to let go, otherwise you sort of end up with your entire, even something like Matilda, I haven't, which is still ongoing. I haven't seen it in about five or six years. And I think it's, I think that's probably right. I think the writer should be the first person to walk away from that project, from these projects, because you're the first person on it, you know? So you have this very intense relationship and then you need to move away because also I think it needs to be its own thing free of you. So I haven't, you know, I tend to stay away from stuff. I mean, I think um, things I remember. I, 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 it's more. It's more the people doing it. You know, it's more the like. I remember seeing it in. Uh, I think it was Peckham Academy, and the kids were just amazing. Like they were just like right up for it. You know, they were really enjoying it, and I just loved that. I just thought that was the thing that I liked was just when they went for it. You know, when they've when I've sort of felt that people are when you feel they're in enjoying it more than it's suddenly really successful as a production you know um i think that's something that i feel more connected to which is you know not in a way is sort of unfair because i know if that was me doing it i would want to make it successful as a production more than i'd want people to enjoy it but from my perspective yeah and i think that what's quite what's quite joyous about it joyous is an odd word to to attribute to a play i suppose which is about someone who falls down a shaft is presumed dead and then because he's alive his friends think they probably should kill him because they yeah. thought he was dead in the first place but it it's the fact that in the wood scenes you've got the entire ensemble you've got all of the characters who were there together except for adam but you've got this these wonderful opportunities for quite a large cast all to be playing together yeah Mm. Yeah. Um, so, um, and and do you have any particular recollections of the set? Because it's set in three different locations. It's um, set in the it starts in the street, and then there's the there are the wood scenes, and then there's the fields. Leah and Phil meet in, and then Phil Phil is left on his own at the end in the field, and Richard comes mm. to visit him. Um, I guess because of the nature of the play which is 14 quite short scenes it's not just just not possible to have a full set those no. locations have got to be implied haven't they and they've got to be sort of symbolized but are there any that caught, that come to mind any ways that those locations well, I, were symbolized i prefer the less realistic settings i remember i think in italy they they um did the forest as like sticks or the woods are just sticks, you know, that then they could be taken down and turned into, um, so, uh, you know, the, the sort of curb of the road and things like this. I, I kind of, I always preferred the less sort of um, literal interpretations. I remember when we did it at the National, we did it with very big video, you know, which was quite, which was really interesting. Um, I'm not sure whether that gave us more than just doing it in the dark. I mean, I, I think I saw it in... Uh, was it Rumford or was it somewhere in Kent? And they just did it in, they had no budget at all and this school and they just did it on a stage with absolutely nothing. And I just really enjoyed it because I, th I think simple is probably good because it's really about the actors saying stuff to each other. 
Yeah, I remember the National Theatre production had, so for the field, I seem to remember you saw like a close up, very enlarged of a little corner of like a football net uh, right. with grass around it. They were just simple kind of right. evocations of the different yeah. locations. But yeah, I mean, the text, the, 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 the play's really in the dialogue, isn't it? Yeah, it's in the mm. dialogue. And that, that's what ma matters most is is the sort of i think that's what res, you know young people respond to as well by the way i think that dialogue is really difficult to do and and, and that's not a um that's not uh undeliberate you know it's not um it's undeliberate a word i don't know your teachers you'll tell me but um it, it's uh, it's deliberate um and i had this theory which i still do have actors are weird like actors are the only people in the world that if you make their job harder, they love it. You know, they pretend they don't, but like, I, you know, actors sort of go, oh, this is really difficult. Oh, look at this. I can't believe you've given me this monologue. Secretly, they love it. They absolutely <laughs> love that they've got a big monologue. Well, they love that it's weird, hard, difficult, intercutting dialogue or, and stuff like this. And so at the time, I figured I wasn't going to make any allowances because I think a, 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 a professional actor and an amateur actor, there's not much difference between, there is a huge amount of difference between them, but you know, not in the um, experience of doing it. You know, I think amateur actors get, maybe you can get more out of um, what they're doing than pros sometime, you know. And I think, so I thought it, if it was about making them enjoy it, I would allow, you know, I would do all the stuff that I normally do in a play, which is normally quite sort of bouncy. The dialogue is quite bouncy. And I think it seems to me that people have, you know, young people have responded to that, you know. And whether they get it right or whether they're able to do it, like I say, was never really my intention but I wasn't going to pull any punches because I, you know I wanted them to be able to enjoy that. I mean it's interesting that you say that you write and rewrite and rewrite because that's what all writers do anyway but especially what's quite deceptive I think about your language is that at first glance it can sort of seem like very spoken language very colloquial spoken language which on the one hand it is but it's so intricate and there are so many repetitions and rhythms woven into it that um, I think that performers can have really huge fun with because you say it's bouncy and the, the, the dialogue itself is 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 bouncy. It's got it's got a pace. It's got energy and momentum that's constantly moving it forwards. Yeah, it's in, it's, it's deceptive, that sort of um, that sort of stuff, because I think it looks like to a lot of actors. I remember doing a play in America, uh, in New York, was, I think it was the second play I'd done there. And the act, I remember one of the actors saying, I, I love what you, the way you've written because it feels really natural, so you don't have to get it exactly right. And it, he was totally wrong, this actor. And I sort of tried to gently say to him, you're, you're wrong there, you know, because actually you do have to get it exactly right. Because if you don't get it right, you're sort of screwed and the other actors are screwed. And he was terrible every night because he felt, you know, he, he, he because he thought he could sort of busk it, it, it means that, you don't learn it properly and then you're kind of always a little bit sort of, but the moment you've learned it properly and you've got everything exactly right, you know, it sort of, the play looks after you. you there's still a lot of room for you to be able to sort of, for, for once you've learned it and you've got it all, then, then you're free, you know, you're free to sort of not improvise because I think you've got to stick to the script, but I mean, you're free to sort of act, you know, um, if you don't actually learn it all, as it's written you're always trying to remember lines which is not acting you know and uh, so that that's something i think is it's always important to do even though it looks like it's oh we can just you can add your own you know or, or like or whatever all of these things that i use quite a lot if you do that you're going to get into trouble but also there is a rhythm in there you know and it kind of it, it, if you if you take the rhythm out of it i think it ends up looking soapy Mm. Yeah, and that you that you I think you you lay down those markers right from the very start of the yeah. play. Those the opening, those three big openings. I think it's three to each of the uh, yeah. between Jan and Mark. Yeah. Where there's the repetition of dead in all different however yeah. you want to different tones or however or pitches or whatever the actor wants to do. But um, there's a really necessary pre precision there. If you trip up you've yeah. tripped up your partner but also you've lost that all of those emotions in there like the fear yeah. and the anxiety and the incredulity yeah that's right mm. um 
So just a couple more questions. And then if people want to um, prepare their questions, if they've got any follow up questions, I'll leave about 10 minutes for that. So um, uh, here's one. What would a sequel to DNA look like? <laughs> uh, we don't know. Maybe 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 that's uh, we should, you know, them. It's them sort of like, you know. 15 years on and we see how they've uh, you know if, how it's worked out for them but uh, i have no idea i have no idea one of them's a dentist oh no he got put off dentistry didn't he but yeah. um i mean it is i suppose you don't have to answer that but what is interesting is that in some respects it's a thriller with a beginning middle and end because we've got this um we've got a problem like in a drama in an ancient greek drama we've got a problem the problem well we've sort of got two pro first we've got the problem that adam's dead and then we've got the problem that actually adam isn't dead he's alive which is just as much a problem because everyone's been told including the media that he's dead um and then the rest of the play is how to resolve this but there isn't really a tidy resolution at the end because no. i mean i sometimes read you know well in the end adam is killed we don't know that the order is given phil gives the order to kill him but we never actually have evidence that he is killed so uh, that's the question what's happened to adam we don't know um unless unless i've misunderstood it'd be interesting to hear what your take is it on it we don't know what's happened to leah we don't know where she's gone or why she's gone has she gone because she just wants to get the hell out of this you know mm. this depravity and this spiraling situation criminal situation or is it because she wants to fulfill or and is it because she wants to fulfill her dream of changing the world as she says she wants to um or is it because she just doesn't want to be implicated there are lots of unanswered questions mm -hmm. and there are also lots of people who are very precarious and vulnerable at the end whose mental health is really on yeah. edge no yeah no one gets away with it you know i mean i think what they've done is uh, a terrible thing i i sort of don't feel that they're terrible people you know i think they've just happened to have done a really terrible thing for stupid reasons you know and uh, i think that's something that we all experience at some time in our life you know i think leah is the sort of moral heart of the play you know she um uh you know she seems to she seems like a sort of geeky girl on the outside but um outside of everything that is oddly obsessed with this person who doesn't talk but I think they have a really useful. It's he, it's really useful for her to that she to, to. I think they have a very good. Um, there's an exchange between them. You know, they get to sit together. He she says a load of stuff, and he doesn't answer. So he can she can project this stuff on him, and he's quite happy to be projected on. He's he's happy. I think they both get from the exchange. You know, but I think, um, you know, she is the moral compass. Of, she's the moral heart of the play, and ultimately, she's the one that walks away you know she's the one that leaves because she can't she knows that you can't do this and it'd be okay but no one gets away scot-free except i always feel the cast you know because it's a it's a play for young people and it is a, a, a great experience that's the kind of paradox i suppose it's yeah uh, yeah yeah Mm. Um, OK, so we've got about 10 minutes. And um, so what you can do if you'd like to ask a question, could you just put it um, put in the chat that you'd like to ask a question? So if you look um, well on my computer, it's in on the right hand corner, top corner, you've got a little bubble. So if you click on the bubble, then the chat function comes up. This is for people yeah. who haven't used Teams. And then you can type in and you can either type in your question, but I'm very happy for you to type in and say, can I ask a question? And then you're very welcome to turn on your camera and your microphone and just ask the question. Can I just remind you, you're all teachers and you know that thing where you say any questions and nobody asks a question. <laughs> and it's a bit awkward and then the first person asks a question and then everyone does and there's no time just remember that as teachers ah oh, here we are we have a question I, we have a question but i just wanted to read you dennis that there's a comment here from julianne salisbury who says my year nine students oh, absolutely yeah. loved it it really made them think about identity peer pressure and relationships oh that's great thank yeah. you 
And then we've got um, George Yu, excuse me if I haven't pronounced your name properly, who asks if Phil and Leah are a couple. Uh, I, I never see them as such. You know, I never think, I don't think that, that whatever their relationship is, it doesn't necessarily need to be... Um, I mean, there's there's a sort of a, 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 a longing from Leah that she needs Phil, but if it weren't Phil, it would be someone else. You know, I think, uh, you know, again, I think Phil is, is a brilliant person to project upon, you know, and I think, you know, I, as a kid, I lived in my own little world, my own little bubble, and I imagined all sorts of things. And, you know, so I, I, but I don't think they're a couple, but they can be played as such. I, I guess what's quite a bit, what's quite tragic there is you say that Leah doesn't need Phil because it could be anyone, but we realise by the end that Phil really needs Leah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think mm. that's right. I think Phil without Leah is is a very, you know, he, he doesn't know how much he needs her until she's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, uh, really, again, excuse the pronunciation, but someone who's come up in my uh, chat as C. Miaello would like to ask a question. So uh, go ahead. Hi, it's Claire. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, Claire. Um, Hi. When I do the play with my students, um, they absolutely love the fact that there are no adult characters at all. And I just wondered if that was something that was always going to be the case or did that develop as you wrote it? They love it that there are no adults and these kids are trying to deal with all these different situations completely or it's perceived to be completely on their own. Yeah. I mean, that was very deliberate because I think when I was a kid, um, I, I, if we had a, if I, I felt like we, we lived in a world without adults in, in that if we had a, if I had a problem, there was no, I could, you certainly couldn't tell a teacher, but that was in those days, you know, because, you know, worse than whatever was going on was the idea that you might be a grass, you know, and I wouldn't be able to tell my parents because I think my mum would have probably given give me a slap and sort of say get on with it you know so I, I felt like very much that we lived in a world that was without adult intervention and and I think that's I think these days kids have we're much more aware of bullying and we're much more sort of you know we take much better care with our uh, with our young people and sort of help them to understand that they don't need to sort of just sit sit with that sort of stuff but at the same time I think they do you know a lot of the time I think it and I think the world of children the world of being a young person is very intense and you don't really believe that adults get it. So I think, yeah, I think it felt to me like whatever problem we had, unfortunately, was it was just us. So, yeah, that was very deliberate. That's lovely. Thank you very much. So there is a question here from um, Jay Blacklock. Um, who asks if you've seen any rehearsal techniques that have been useful for developing character? Um, I can't really say that there's any uh, on, on my mind. I mean, I think, you know, I always sort of like people sitting around the table and working things out for a little while. But, you know, the, the, the you know, um, action thing that Max Stafford Clark used to do is, is obviously very, it's probably a bit old fashioned now, but it's kind of useful to know what it is that people are trying to do uh, with a line. So, um, but nothing that I could probably, nothing that I could usefully say. Uh, well, um, Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. Blacklock, this is not a pitch for the book exactly, but it is, but there are some ideas in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got another question, good question here. Why is Phil silent for so much of the play? In the first draft of the play, Phil spoke. When I, first, I wrote a first few pages, not first draft. I mean, I really not got beyond before about four or five pages and it just didn't work. And so I totally rewrote it and I wrote it with just Leah speaking and Phil not saying a word. And that really, really worked. Suddenly it sort of became a, a play, you know. And I think Phil is not saying anything because he, like I say, the world has, the, his, the world, their world has suddenly become scary. You know, it's suddenly become a dangerous, dangerous place. And his tactic is to stay, is to shut up, do nothing and get through it, which is actually not an, not a stupid thing to do. Um, I think it doesn't work. And actually, I think him beginning to speak may have been where he went wrong. If he'd have just shut up and sat there eating his sweets. You know, I think I think the food thing with Phil as well. You know, food just makes a lot of sense. You eat it and it tastes nice. You know, it's just, I think he's just trying to get through through these few years. That's my view on that. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting also, it's just occurred to me, I mean, questions of racism and on the one hand, you know, OK, don't get involved. And on the other hand, show some kind of allyship, otherwise you're complicit. So that's adding a whole other layer, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. I, but I think also that, that um, uh, when when things are, I think that the, what Phil is potentially faced with is something that's possibly possibly violent and dangerous. And I think um, when it really, when, when things are really scary, like, um, you know, I think showing allyship is absolutely the right thing to do. If you, but if you were sort of at a National Front convention, uh, you might not, not that there is a National Front, but if you, you know, a Ku Klux Klan meeting, you might not do it in that moment because it would threaten your life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, the right thing to do would be to sort of stand up and be counted. But, you know, who, I, I'm not brave enough to do that. And I think, you know, Phil, you know, he's, like I say, he's just a kid trying to get through through a few years, you know. Mm. Um, so you mentioned that um, the kids are possibly 12, 13, that like Phil's possibly 12, 13, so he's just riding out a few years until he leaves school. So the question from Ursula Page is, what age range do you think the play is, is kind of targeted at could it be appropriate for for older teenagers yeah i think so i mean i think it could be appropriate for younger younger kids as well i think it could be um you know uh, any sort of from 11 12 13 but i think you could you know 15 16 possibly even 17 i think any old you know may, maybe when you start getting older i think there may be uh, the decision making is a little bit younger than than sort of 17 or 18 but i think anywhere from 11 to 16 you could do it mm -hmm. and finally we've got our final question great question to end on um um uh, about chimpanzees and bonobos it's interesting yeah. that we haven't mentioned them yet actually no. um so the question is about the chimpanzees and the bonobos and specifically if their behavior might be somehow mapped onto the children's behaviour, if we can read the children's behaviour through that paradigm of the chimpanzees and the bonobos. Yeah, I, I think it is really important in the in the um, uh, in the in the play. And of course, one thing that the play doesn't mention because I couldn't find a, a way of putting it in is that bonobo, bonobos are matriarchal, chimpanzees are patriarchal. You know, um, I mean, you know, I don't think we should necessarily read too much into that, but metaphorically, that's very interesting. You know, and I think. Um, they the discovery of bonobos that you know we thought they were chimpanzees for a long time but the discovery of bonobos and their behavior um is a really profound thing because i think it's quite possible that um as leah says had we known about bonobos before chimpanzees we might have had a very different view of ourselves but i think this kind of um you know survival of the fittest law of the jungle uh hyper darwinian view of who we are is sort of deep rooted in us now you know that we you know that we are kind of ultimately brutal my own view is that we are brutal um you know it's really hard to argue that humanity is not brutal uh, we are an we are an incredibly violent violent and brutal species but we're also the opposite of that at the same time we're an incredibly you know we we um create these enormous social structures to benefit people but sometimes we create these enormous social structures to destroy and torture people you know so we're, we're capable of both sorts of things so I, I suppose the question is are we chimpanzees or are we bonobos chimpanzees are you know really can be incredibly brutal and they war and they torture you know uh, bonobos don't do that um so it, it, you know it's i suppose that's the sort of question in the play what are we going to be are we going to be are we going to choose to be chimpanzees we're going to choose to be bonobos yeah and it was not difficult for me to choose a front cover for the book because i just <laughs> i just went through google of all the most adorable pictures of mummy bonobos with their babies uh, so that was a very pleasant afternoon that I spent. And this also has been a very pleasant uh, afternoon spent with you, Dennis. Um, were there any other um, comments that you wanted to make about about the about DNA? 
No, no, it's end. been very, it's been really, really nice. It's been very sort of comprehensive. And, and you know, your questioning as always has been really kind of like you, you, you've sort of covered it all. And, you know, I, I think it's uh, obviously it's, it's a, you know, uh, I think, um, I, you know, you're, you're all teachers. So you're trying to get the kids through exams and that's got to come first, you know. But like I say, the impetus for writing the play was so that they would enjoy it. You know, so that, that was my thing and it's very easy for me to say hey make them enjoy it you know uh but you've got a whole bunch of other things that you need to think about and that are probably more important than that but like i say i think if it, it's possible that if they you know i don't think their their, their sort of journey in theater should end with dna i think it should start with dna and hopefully they'll like yeah, they'll they'll see that theater hopefully can be fun and they can play around with it and then they'll go off and find other you know more hardcore things well, my experience of having te taught DNA and a host of other plays by you is that students both thoroughly enjoy it. They love it, as quite a few people have put in the chat, and they get really high marks because they love it. So, um, oh, that, yeah, so everyone's really happy. OK, uh, so thank you so much, Dennis. And um, we'll leave you to get back to yeah. the exciting things you're doing in Kensal Rise, whatever they are. <laughs> and um, hope to see you soon. And uh, thank you very much to um, everyone who's come today. It's a shame we haven't all been able to be in the same room and uh, kind of get that vibe. But it's been really enjoyable anyway. And thank you for all of your really fascinating questions and comments. And Dennis, I don't know if you can see the chat, but there are lots of people saying thank you and how useful it is. They're flooding in. And thanks very much and take care. Thanks for the opportunity to listen, uh, etc. And a recording will be available. So um, uh, just the last thing, uh, Katie and Sarah, I'll stay on the call if, if you want me to. But um, everyone else, thank you and have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thanks, Claire. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, you, and thank you, Claire, as well. Thank you so much for brilliant hosting. Very, very welcome.